Good afternoon and welcome back to Edinburgh to Joe and Mike's virtual tour. Now what we'd like to do is put this up here. You can see it's Piping Scott Tours. Please share with your friends our little tours. Uh, we're actually going all around the world. We really appreciate that. So if you like us and share with us on Facebook, Piping Scott Tour, we'd really appreciate that. And I want to say thank you to quite a few people who've been watching us and thank you very much for the gratuities we've been receiving. It really is well accepted. As you know, we've got no work on, so we do this. We love what we do. We have a passion for Scotland, a passion for Edinburgh, and we love sharing a little bit of our city with you abroad there. And also, we said last week, um, a wee bit of home goes a long way. So I'd like to thank uh, Kenneth Alderton, who lives in Birkenhead in Cheshire. So thank you very much, Kenneth. We really appreciate that. Susan Hartman in Palmyra in Pennsylvania, USA. Thank you again. We've got Sandra Patterson, a practical local girl in Glasgow. Thank you, Sandra. Really appreciate that. And we've got John Duthie from Glasgow. Thank you very much, John. And a good friend, Margaret McCann from my hometown of Stirling. So thank you very much. And a big shout out goes to Sylvia in Ontario in Canada. And I would like to say a big hello to Nick Carruthers in San Francisco. Nick was over here a couple of years ago. We want to come back again. We look forward to seeing you when you come back to Scotland. So let's start on our little tour, shall we? Now we're Andy, still. Andy says hello from Kirkcaldy. From Kirkcaldy, we've got somebody from Fife as well. <laughs> there we go. All over the world, including Fife. <laughs> so we're back on the Royal Mile. As I mentioned before, the Royal Mile connects the castle at the top. We've already been to the castle. And we'll finish off in one of our tours in the future down at the Palace of Holyrood House, which is at the bottom of the Royal Mile. Now we're on a part of the Royal Mile called the High Street. So we'll be walking down here. People say, why the Royal Mile? It's, it's, there's so much to see and so much to do, even in this small part of the city. So we'd like to look at things that are a bit unusual that you, as tourists, you might not see as you're walking around on your own. We're hopefully pointing out some things to you. I wanted to point out initially the church right behind me. This is a Tron church. Tron. T-R-O-N. Tron comes from the old, not old, Norman French, Trono or Tronel, which means way or balance. And the Tron is where you would actually get your public weighing facilities. So if you were buying things like flour or bread or anything that need weights, and you thought you were being undersold, you can go and get it checked at the Tron make sure the merchant was undercharging charging you or giving you the wrong weight of your whichever you were buying however some of those merchants were a bit shall we say unscrupulous and some of them would purposely give you less flour or less water or less whatever you were buying um, if they were caught doing this it said they would actually nail them by the ear to the door of the tron However, in, in Scotland it gets quite cold and if this happens in winter time, the merchants wouldn't want to stay there too long and a few of them actually ripped their own ears. And so if you were buying anything from the merchants, you could actually ask them to show their ears. And if you saw marks on their ears, you could see that they've been, they've been rip-off merchants. Hence the expression that we use nowadays, the rip-off merchants. But let's go back to the church. The church itself dates back to the 1600s. And it was a, one of the first churches built after the Reformation, so it's never been a Catholic church. It has simply been a Protestant church. It got damaged in the 1800s during the Great Fire of Edinburgh. You may have heard of the Great Fire of London, but it was the Great Fire of Edinburgh. And the church did get damaged and they re re rebuilt it. It stopped being a congregational church in the 1960s and 70s. And nowadays it's used for exhibition space. It's also used as a little marketplace. But again, going back to the 1600s, right in the middle of Edinburgh. Let's walk a little bit down. So we go from the 1600s, and I want to point out this building on the other side of the street here. This is the Radisson Blue Hotel. If you look at it, it looks completely in place with the old town of Edinburgh. But this was actually built in 1990. And I think the architects got a lot of awards for compassion in their architecture because it certainly fits in with the old town of Edinburgh and it's well worth going inside. It's very modern on the inside but it's well in place with the old buildings here in the Royal Mile. Let's take a little walk down. 
because Street Life, I've been watching our, our recordings over the weeks. They've noticed that more and more people are coming back onto the streets of Edinburgh. Cafe Society has opened up again, pubs are opened up, bars are opened up. And we mentioned before, if you look down here, the little closes that we have taking you into almost like a different century. This is Carrubber's Close. Some gentlemen enjoying their afternoon at the bar. Lots of pubs on the Royal Mile and they all do good food as well. So if you're looking for a nice lunch here in Edinburgh, you can't go wrong with the pub food and the pub grub. Now this part of Edinburgh going down towards Holyrood, again it's all steeped in history. And some of the buildings you see were date back to the 1600s. However, some of the buildings themselves were very overcrowded, especially in the 1800s. They had built the new town of Edinburgh, so all the well-heeled people and all the well-to-do people actually moved out of the old town over to the new town of Edinburgh. The city was booming, the population was growing for various different reasons. Industrialisation had started, people were migrating from the countryside into the cities. So the buildings themselves were getting more and more crowded. How are you doing? Where are you all from? Um, we're from Southport. Southport? Uh -huh. Are you up for your vacation? Are we holiday? Uh, four days, yeah. Four, four days. Lovely days here. Well, you're on live broadcast. Say hi to the camera. Oh, right. You've been broadcast to the world. <laughs> so our tourists are coming back as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you like Edinburgh? What do you think of Edinburgh? Oh, yeah, lovely time. Great city, isn't it? Lovely walk up there. And what do you think of the people? If we were cheese, we would eat ourselves. <laughs> nice to have a little live broadcast there. So I mentioned that the buildings were getting more and more crowded. People were living on top of each other. The city itself was not really looking after its architecture or its buildings. Come with me. Weren't looking after the buildings. So people were living cheek by jowl. Sometimes you get 14 or 15 people in one room. And there's one particular house in the 1800s that actually collapsed. And it's this building here. Now I'm going to show you a little photograph of the time or a drawing of the time. It's now called Paisley Close, but this whole building collapsed. And maybe you can see that here. This is the aftermath of the collapse of the building. Of the 70 people that were in the building, they say about 35 of them survived. But there's one little guy, his name was Joe McIver. So people were digging down and digging down from this collapsed building, trying to find trying to find survivors. And one of the survivors was little Joe McIver. They were digging away and digging away and digging away. And early in the morning, they were still digging. And then suddenly they saw his legs sticking out of the rubble. And he was shouting to them. And he was shouting, heave away, chaps. I'm not dead yet. And so when they rebuilt the building in 1800s, they actually put a little picture or motif off look, Joe McIver up there and it's now called Paisley Close. The act of the building actually falling down changed the whole legal uh, housing legal system here in Edinburgh. The city then started to look at some of its old buildings because some of them have been standing since the 1600s. Um, they were not safe to live in and the, this whole collapse of the building, people that died, um, caused the city council to change the law and a lot of the buildings that were decrepit and falling apart were actually taken down. Let's move down a little bit further. I mentioned that some of the buildings that will date back to the 1600s. I'm going to take you down to one down here, which is known as John Knox House. I mentioned John Knox before. John Knox was a firebrand preacher back in the 1600s. 
and you could say he was almost like the father of the Reformation. I don't know whether or not he lived in the house, but it actually is known as John Knox's house. The man who owned it originally was a, a chap called Mossman. Now Mossman himself was a supporter of Mary Queen of Scots and he was a Catholic. Mossman was a goldsmith. He was a very, very wealthy man. However, his wealth didn't really save him because during the Ref Reformation, because of his support of Mary Queen of Scots, Mossman was taken out and he was tried and he was hanged. You never knew what was going to happen during the Reformation. Who would be coming to your door? Whether it be the Catholics or the Protestants, you never really knew. But the house is now a museum. This is, is coming up to John Knox's house. It is a museum. It's a lovely building to go into here. And you can see the stories here. It's up on here. It said, Love God above all and your neighbours as well. In old Scots up here. This sundial up here is meant to be Abraham up here. And you've got the word of God in both Greek and Latin and English. The museum's closed at the moment, but it's well worth going in when you're here in Edinburgh. And I really like this building here, particularly because it's attached to one of my favourite places in Edinburgh. And this is the Scottish Tory Storytelling Centre. Scots are great storytellers. Whether it's folklore or modern stories, I highly recommend if you get the opportunity, especially in August, this is August already started, we should be in the middle of an Edinburgh International Festival. However, things being as they are, the festival is actually online. So if you're looking for some performances, just Google Edinburgh Festival and you'll see things in there that are free. I've already mentioned the book festival, which starts in about a week's time. I would highly recommend you get an, get an online and you meet some of the authors, not only Edinburgh authors or Scottish authors, but international authors as well. Now having a look at the house here. Old fashioned Edinburgh houses here. You can see the stairwell leading up the stairs here. So we're coming down to an area that some people who uh, maybe watch Outlander may have actually heard of the world's end. So we're coming down to the world's end shortly. But I'd like to show you this coat of arms here. This is a coat of arms that says IR6. IR6. Well, it actually is meant to be a J. There's no J in the Latin alphabet, so they put I. So it's JR, so it's JR6. So that's James King the Sixth. So King James the Sixth and his wife there. The date is 1606. Now this black was relevant because I mentioned before that Edinburgh was a walled city. Back in the 1600s, you were not allowed to go in or out the city unless you paid money. Which meant that the gates of the city were closed at a specific time every day. And they would ring a bell. And the bell would ring to warn people that the gates were being closed. So it was a kind of a curfew in the city. Yeah. So there was a curfew in the city. Now I mentioned that people had to pay to go in and out of the city itself. But some people were so poor that they couldn't afford to go out of the city at all. So in real terms, their world actually ended right here. And across the street, we've got the pub called the World's End Pub. And it's called the World's End Pub because this is where people's worlds ended. Now the gates were taken away in the end of the 1600s, beginning of the 1700s. The bell was retained, and I don't know if Mike can turn around and you'll see on top of this tower, there is a bell. And this is the bell that was used to announce that the city was closing its gates.
we still keep a memory here in Edinburgh of the gates that were here. This is known as the Nether Bow. And in the cobblestones, and I wouldn't advise anyone to just run out in the middle of the traffic to see it, but we do keep gold, we call them sets or cobbles here, which marks where the gates were to go in and out of the city. Now the World's End pub, when people come here they always wonder why is it called the World's End? It's not a premonition, it's not, a, it's not being foretold, it's uh, not, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world as such, it's just a mean that this is where people's world ended. So what we're going to do now, we're going to hand over, we'll do a little switch over as before, and Mike will take the microphone and I will take the camera. So we'll see you all again, remember, Piping Scott Tours, Joe and Mike's Piping Scott Tour, go to Facebook and like us and share us. And now we'll just hand over to Mike. Hope you're all enjoying this. And I'll speak to you all again soon. Tony McPherson's watching. So, it's nice Good. to see you. Get somebody we're at the Chuck Carlton family from Oregon. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, welcome to my, this, my part of this uh, tour uh, with Joe today and I'd just like to say a, say a special hello to Sue and Bob Hartman, Sue and Bob Hartman who uh, had fantastic laughs and such like when they were over here and all the best and uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, gesture. Say hi to, Frances you say hi to Francesca, Francesca Carvel to say Joe. Best kilt ever, and I love to hear story. Francesca Carvel, yes, yes, hello to you from us, and, and uh, just thanking you for the complimentary statement on his kilt, so all good, yeah. So we're going to continue this tour, and uh, we're going to walk across uh, this uh, part of uh, Edinburgh High Street. It's uh, not quite the Cannon Gate. Uh, at this point was the, just as Joe was saying, the division where the old gateway was uh, separating what was Edinburgh from the Cannon Gate. And it uh, remained a separate place until 1856, uh, until the Cannon Gate was uh, absorbed by Edinburgh. So all the way that we've come down was Edinburgh, all the way back down there be uh, behind me is the Cannon Gate. So we're going to walk through one of Edinburgh's famous closes, which means a closed access, a narrow entry between buildings. We're going to just to continue up here. Now it wasn't uncommon for most Scottish trading cities, uh, towns to have one main street, one big street for trading and uh, small streets leading off it to backlands. A mixture of different uh, peoples from the quite wealthy merchants to the very humble people at the bottom uh, where they kind of mixed and matched and stayed together in different areas of the town. So we're going to walk down this uh, Tweedale Court, which is a location from Outlander, and it's when uh, Claire comes back, having been back to her own time, <coughs> and uh, she returns to Edinburgh after having met Jamie at the famous print shop, and uh, then she discovers some other old pals that she'd met. Uh, in their travels going back to the 18th century and they used this for a market scene, Tweedale Court, it's much used for film locations. Right. We just got a hello from Lumia and Nick in oh. California. Oh hi Lenny and Nick, thank you and hello to you from Edinburgh. Now we've suddenly got a lot quieter because we've come into the backlands of Edinburgh, off the main high street part. And this was much the same going back into the 16th and 17th centuries, where if you could afford it, you would build a nice house and it would be quiet and it would have a garden. And we're going to walk to this cream-coloured building just ahead of us here. 
uh, with its wonderful entrance with the pillars. And this was uh, built for a man called Neil Lang and his wife, who was uh, Elizabeth Danielson in the 16th century. So it's uh, going back to the 1500s and Neil Lang was what we call a writer to the signet. Now Edinburgh was a place of the practice of law and legal affairs and the signet, writers to the signet still exist today. It's a kind of uh, tick opposite your name and that you are quite high up in the practice of law. Uh, but back then, in the 16th century, writers, that, that was the description of lawyers, of solicitors, were known as writers. And the signet originally was the great seal of the king. So if you were a writer to the great seal of the king, it meant that you were dealing in very important affairs. So you would have the resources to have a nice house like this in the back area. It went through various transformations. Uh, in the 17th century, the Marquis of Tweedale, who was a top advisor to King Charles II, uh, he resided here too. And then it became uh, the British Linen Bank in later transformations and Oliver and Boyd, you can still see above the door today, publisher and printer. And if I take your eye up here uh, to this balcony, if you notice this curved piece of metal, that was for hauling supplies from down below up through the window, supplies like inks and paper and the sort of materials that you would use in the printing industry. But we mentioned earlier that Edinburgh is a city of literature with many writers and many publications and a Chambers Dictionary amongst many uh, other great uh, literary tomes if you like because it's the Cyclopaedia Britannica, because we also mentioned uh, that the Scots were very literate through religious transformation, encouraged to read the Bible, even before their neighbours down in England. So very cultivated. So we, today we have got this original 16th century house, and would you believe it was under threat of demolition? And a later uh, group of people <laughs> carried on the tradition of Patrick Garris saying, hang on, we want to save this building and thank goodness they did because it's most wonderful and it's in an L shape. You may think that that's all it is, it's just this one section here but it actually carries around in an L shape there also. We've got Sandy Chantos from Canada saying hi. Oh hi Sandy. And Magnus and Linda. Okay, hi Magnus and Linda. <laughs> Thanks for watching, hope you're enjoying it. Now we're going to take a view uh, just back here to show you how narrow these entrances were and you could, they said, if you're going back to about 16th, 17th century, you could put your hand out a window and shake hands with your neighbours because the gap between the buildings is so narrow and you can still see that exists today. If you can draw your attention to this piece of stone work. This is part of the King's Wall and if you were watching our earlier a live feed from Greyfriars Churchyard. I showed you where these various walls were uh, put up as defensive walls. This went back to the 15th century and it's still here today, part of the King's Wall. Turning you around here to a sedan chair storage house going back to the 18th century. You know what a sedan chair is? It's a chair you would sit, usually if you were wealthy, and two muscular Highlanders uh, would carry you through the streets of Edinburgh, old Edinburgh, which was very messy uh, to avoid getting all your nice uh, fashionable clothes dirty, keep your nice white socks clean for the men, keep your long dresses out of the dirt for the women. So sedan chairs was also used to conve convey dead bodies <laughs> with the blinds drawn on the windows because remember we talked about the trade in uh, bodies for Edinburgh University Medical School. But anyway, protected building, 18th century sedan chair house here on my left. Now we're going to walk out of Tweedale Court, named after the Marquis of Tweedale, of course, who I mentioned earlier. It's just, I, I love the architecture. You know, this old lamp and the stonework. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so you can't just put in a modern window or do what you like you are restrained because we want to keep the historic feel of the city uh, very much here. It's 
So we're going to just walk up the hill, back up, and we've got a few more hidden gems to talk about. You see a lot of tartan, cashmere. Cashmere is one of the highway sought after items when people come uh, to Scotland. And there's all sorts of different qualities of cashmere. And tartan, of course, as well. So there's all these closes, and some of the time the closes are named after uh, people who had houses at the bottom of these accesses. So we've got a uh, fountain close here as well. Welcome to family, Cheryl. She's coming up from Scotland, from Oregon. First time in spring. Oh, great. I look forward to that. Maybe you'll hook up with us, or one of us. We'll maybe give you a guided tour. <laughs> so the sun's coming out and uh, you've got a beautiful view of John Knox's house there in the sun. There's one of those wellheads that Joe spoke about in the last tour, which was where you got water, that big block of stone. And I'm just going to walk us over the street now. Well, getting busier as Edinburgh eases out of lockdown. So you see that big stone block. The water was usually quite contaminated and it was a overcrowded city, so you could just imagine if there was a disease, pollution, how it would spread. And if I can just uh, show you this here, this gap here, in order to work the pump, to pump the water out, you had a big piece of wood that would go through the slot, you'd pull it up and down, and the water would come out here. Now, there was lots of livestock around Edinburgh Old Town, so most of the time they were polluting the water supply. So, drinking water today is great, just out of the tap. It's some of the best water you could possibly get. I think I've mentioned before, the whisky industry. And if we didn't get our share of rain, we couldn't come and have all this beautiful, wonderful landscape, greenery and such like, and our national zinc, Scotch whisky. So I'm going to take you down another hidden gem here, Chalmers Close. And Chalmers was a buckle maker. There was a lot of leather workers here, if you're going back to about 16th century, even before that. And uh, we're going to wander down here. This is a place that not an awful lot of people might come down. You certainly probably wouldn't come down here at night. Uh, and I would advise that, you know. Uh, ahead of us, jury's in. An example of untypical Edinburgh architecture. <laughs> very, very much uh, modular, modern architecture, but I'm not going to speak about that. I've got something which I think is much more interesting to talk about. Right, this building here, just at the bottom of the steps, I think I'll stop here at the moment so you can get a view looking upwards of uh, the church architecture. This is called Old Trinity College Church and would you believe it goes back to 1462 and it was built by the wife, the Queen, of uh, King James II who was killed very tragically at the siege of Roxburgh Castle in uh, 1460 and there's a memorial to her husband and she was Mary of Gilders uh, of a Dutch family and I think we may have some people from the Low Countries watching <laughs> who knows and uh, she was so bereft uh, she had to build this memorial to her husband and uh, dating back to that time now it was said to be the finest building uh, in Edinburgh next to Holyrood Abbey uh, 15th century church, but it was a victim of uh, progress because it was sited in a different place and in the 1840s that different place was going to be Waverley Station and this building they decided was going to be removed and we're not far away from Waverley Station and various people were hugely annoyed at this including Lord Coburn 
who was a great preserver, a great critic of anybody that was going to change things too much. But they dismantled this building, stone by stone, and put it onto Carlton Hill on the understanding that North British Railway Company were going to come up with £16,000 after the Waverley station was built and it was going to be rebuilt and they numbered all the stones and it was kept up at Carlton Hill in a yard. Now I think we can maybe come down a bit closer and Joe might want to get a wee photograph picture of the gargoyles just love this building. People talk about the oldest building in Edinburgh, 12th century, Queen Market's Chapel. But come down here and look at this. This is a real bit of history. Going back to 1462 and Mary of Gilders was buried in this church as well. And you can understand the outrage. They had to move her remains and they were removed to the Abbey of Holyrood. And in this church is this was found after the Reformation, there was a lot of destruction, 1560. They burnt churches, they threw away altarpieces, destroyed them. And here is this um, diptych, as it's called, uh, which is a two-piece thing. It's got this uh, center area, but there was another part to it on the back, uh, which had the Virgin Mary which was actually destroyed. Okay, it's in three pieces, but if you turned this round, you would only see two wings with a blank area in the centre. And this actually portrays uh, Queen Margaret of Denmark and King James III, who was the son of King James II, to who this chapel was dedicated. And next door to him, this little child here, is thought to be King James IV who had a lot to do with the demise of his father in a battle. And uh, it gives you an idea of the ambitions of even young people back then. So this survives in the National Gallery of Scotland, and I say it's the most significant painting in Scotland, or one of the most significant in Scotland's history. So, uh, wonderful. It's just incredible. Now, it was said while the stones at Cal on Calton Hill were there, they were all numbered. And I came down here not so long ago and I saw the numbers on the stones, which are still there. Now, I don't know if we can pick them out or not. They may be weathered a bit, but they discovered, they went up Calton Hill and it was incomplete. It was like a jigsaw puzzle and many of these bits had gone missing. People had stolen them. They'd stolen gargoyles and various statues to put as garden ornaments. In near the houses and had taken bits of stone to build the houses. So it's incomplete. The apse and the choir, although in its most complete form it didn't have a nave, but it had much more than what we can see today. But it's a gem of uh, Edinburgh's architecture. Love it. Just love these hidden gems. So we're going to go up the stairs again. The sun's just coming out. You see some of these, even these high, more modern buildings over on my right there. There's an Episcopalian church, uh, which was uh, originally uh, built on to the remains of uh, the Trinity Church when it was uh, reassembled, but then that was demolished and a church was relocated further over, which is the Episcopal Church. So this was life in Edinburgh. If you stayed in Edinburgh's old town, you would be probably staying in one of these very tall, overcrowded buildings. Certainly going back to the 15th and 16th centuries. Got to show you this before we leave uh, that um, these remains. I've got a picture of where the church was located originally. I'm going to show you that. So, you can see, right, 
You can see here, you have got the Holy Trinity Church in its original position, which is the yards and sidings of Waverley Station today. And you can see Carlton Hill behind, and this was it in its more complete form before it was taken apart. And this is an old engraving. Okay. Right. So we'll move onwards uh, to the final stop in my part of the tour. So we're just going to head up again and we can maybe capture a bit of the beautiful St Giles Cathedral and the Ton. Joe was talking about earlier on. And get lots of kilt shops here. And kilts, uh, good to get them to made to measure, although they can be a bit more expensive. Craft beers and gin. Uh, Edinburgh is a big gin producer today. There's Edinburgh Gin and there's Hollywood uh, Distillery as well. So we're going to pop over to this other street carefully. Say that that. Uh, Wilson saying hello to you, Mike from Aaron. Uh, oh, hi, Wilson, Aaron. Nice to, to to know you're watching. Hope you're enjoying the tour. So this is called Blackfriars Street. It wasn't originally called that. It was called Blackfriars Wind, because it was originally quite a windy street. And Blackfriars, uh, they were the Dominican friars, like monks who had a monastery at the bottom of the street, so hence the name Black Fires. Now, this uh, building here is today Backpackers Hostel, High Street Hostel. But it's actually, surprisingly enough, uh, was a house of a quite an important man. And he was uh, called James Douglas, who was the er fourth Earl of Morton at the time of Mary Queen of Scots in the 16th century and he was uh, also one of two warring families the other f family was the Hamiltons and they were always trying to ingratiate themselves with the young monarchs of Scotland so they were never very happy but you can see the remains today of the 16th century house and if we go a bit closer The unicorn is the national animal of Scotland and above the doorway here you can see on either side two seated unicorns and in the centre you have got a shield and uh, it's quite an elaborate uh, entrance and I can show you how it originally was back in the 16th century. You can see the bit that exists still today but look at this overhang. This is all about maximising space and overhanging uh, a thoroughfare and this, uh, with improvement and making places safe, was very much timber constructed but was actually taken away to flatten it out the way it is today. Now I've got a picture of the man. And here he is. James Douglas, fourth uh, Earl of Morton and if you see behind him this is their family seat or one of them which is Tantallon Castle uh, which is in Berwickshire along in the east coast of uh, Scotland very powerful he was a conspirer he was a conspirator he was not one of those who liked Mary Queen of Scots an awful lot and was instrumental in the death of Mary Queen of Scots's husband he was known as one of the Lords of Congregation, who were very powerful Protestants, and uh, it was inconvenient to have a Catholic monarch some of the time. So he was uh, involved in the murder of Mary Queen of Scots's young husband. Uh, there was, of course, the death of uh, Rizzio, 
this Queen's secretary as well, but he was also instrumental in that too. So he was a kind of murderous, very ambitious character with lots of power. And you can tell by his black outfit. People that dressed in black, black was quite an expensive uh, colour to have and wear back then. So it oozed power and authority. Now, after the... He, he, he kind of forced Mary Queen of Scots to abdicate. And in 1567, she signed the abdication, and he had even more power because he was the regent to the young uh, son of Mary Queen of Scots, who was to become James VI of Scotland. And he remained a powerful man until James reached more maturity and decided he didn't need some, the regent, somebody working uh, for him so much. And then it was discovered how he had been involved in the murder of Henry Darnley. And this man brought the guillotine to Scotland. He imported it as well in a very clean form of execution. And it's very ironic that he met his end at the guillotine. So there you go, the house of uh, James Douglas, Earl of Morton. Now I'll give you one final thing before we leave here. There was a great feud between the Douglas family and the Hamilton family. And both of them had a lot of control during the the kingship of King James V, who was the father of Mary Queen of Scots, and they were tied in with trade and allied to the traders in Leith, as the Douglas family were, and the Hamiltons were allied to the Burgesses, the traders of Edinburgh, and there was a big fracas here in Blackfriars Street in 1520 called a Tulsi, a Tulsi from the old Scots, which means a street fight when a thousand people uh, were fighting against each other, the Hamiltons against the Douglases, and 70 people were killed here. It was a huge bloodshed and they went into battle with great pikes, so it was devastation. And it was the Hamiltons who had to leave because they really lost most people. Most of their people died in that great, terrible thing, terrible outrage. So I'm going to leave you here at uh, Blackfriars Street. Say guten Tag to Marina in Hamburg in Germany. Guten Tag, Marina. <laughs> I'll say uh, hi to Robin in Montana. And hi Rob in Montana, thanks for joining us. I hope you're enjoying this tour here. And it is a sunny Edinburgh just now. So we're just about to sign off and before we do, we'd like you to like uh, Piping Scott Tours and to share our uh, video, our live feed and encourage other people to come on. And also we've got a link, a PayPal link, uh, which would much appreciate any contribution. If you've enjoyed these tours and you'd like to see more of them, then we would appreciate the resources to continue these because I think we're getting a lot of uh, connections here. So uh, I think that's just about it. Yep. And uh, from Joe and myself, I'll say goodbye. all the best. Bye-bye and see you on the next one. But we are going to have another site, which is going to be called Joe and Mike's Virtual Tours of Scotland. So look out for that and future live feeds will be on that page on Facebook. But stick with Piping Scott Tours until we get that up. And okay. Kirsten just saying hi from Utah. Hi Kirsten, all the best for, uh, to Utah. I know Utah, it's a beautiful state. And uh, I don't know how the weather is here, but it's probably a bit cooler here just now than it is in Utah. So, okay, bye-bye, all the best.